Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals, so check them out. LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. Coming up, Stephen Hayes, the CEO of The Dispatch on inflation, China, and the January 6th hearings. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Today, I want to take an opportunity with Steve Hayes, who is the CEO of The Dispatch, which is a relatively new publication, which is very worth subscribing to. A little plug there for you, Steve. But I want to talk about a few different items because there's just so much going on. You and I sort of texted in the last 24 hours about no shortage of things to talk about. But so welcome and thanks. I think the first thing I want to go at is inflation and gas prices. It's at the top of everyone's mind. And I want to see if you agree with me on something. Joe Biden takes office and the first thing he does is shuts down the Keystone XL pipeline. And I'll never forget that because in the back of my mind, I thought, "Uh uh-oh, this is sending a signal that could have a ripple effect on the economy, on gas prices. And I'm not sure that's the only driver here, but what do you remember about that Mm -hmm. That first moment of his, that decision, it 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 isn't the only driver, but it's a major factor. I mean, I think there's a there's a well. First, let me back up. Thrilled to be with you. Thrilled <laughs> to have you doing this. Um, Thank you. I, you know, I, I said I said before we started that um, including sanity as as part of your uh, the name of your podcast, I think is very welcome. When we first pitched the dispatch, we're a couple of years old now. We called ourselves um, sane conservatives. Right. So we are we are happy to be with you in the in the same sanity boat. Um, yes, I, I think I think your question is a, is a great one. I mean, there's a there's a contradiction at the heart of Biden administration policy right now, and it is that Joe Biden wants to diminish the importance of fossil fuels. He wants to yeah. diminish the production. He wants to make it harder. He wants to make it more expensive for the companies that do it. And ultimately, as he said during the campaign, he would be fine seeing the fossil fuel industry end. That's because he believes strongly in that being one of the main things uh, the United States needs to do to fight climate change. Fair enough. That's his position. But you can't then now in the moment where you're seeing your, your political fortunes, if you're Joe Biden, being determined largely because of inflation and gas prices in particular, you don't get to just wave that all away. I mean, as you point out, I mean, it was Keystone. It was it was the the, the leases on public lands. Um, it was the, the you, know, you can point to about fifty different policy uh, announcements that the president made, and they have had the net effect of contributing to the diminishing supply right. of oil and gas. And look, there are other, you know, major factors. The, the war in Ukraine certainly is a big factor. Um, but the, the contradiction at the heart of what Joe Biden wants to do is his effort to diminish the importance of fossil fuels, the oil and gas industry in particular, but also wanting to keep prices low because it's hurting his political prospects. <laughs> it sure is. I mean, it, it, everyone feels this, and some people feel it's so much worse. I mean, it's so difficult for lower income to middle income brackets to go fill up their tank and go, oh my gosh, yes, am I going to be able to afford lunch today because I just spent a hundred bucks filling my tank? It's it's insane. And it, particularly, I was just in Chicago and, and prices are far higher there than they are here in, in Minneapolis area where I live. And so I'm thinking to myself, these crowded cities with income levels of all kinds, and these people are expected to pay this price to get to work, to maybe conduct their business. And then you have some in the administration saying, well, this is a great moment because now we can see that we should all just be driving battery charged vehicles, Teslas. And it's like, those are really expensive right now because we don't 
have the capability to mass produce them to bring the prices down. I mean, right. I, I find that a, a bit insulting and elitist. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just unbelievably tone deaf. I don't remember the exact figure, but I think that, you know, the sort of entry price for for some of these uh, electric vehicles is, you know, $56,000 or, or something on, on average. Like, most people can't afford that. And no. it's insulting to hear to hear them offer this as a, as a uh, you know, some kind of a, a, a widespread solution. I think one in 20 cars produced in the United States right now is an electric vehicle. Well, that's not enough. That's not going to solve the problem. And as you point out, I mean, you know, last week you have Joe Biden, you know, leading this meeting of international leaders to talk about ways to, to limit global emissions, to accelerate the transition to clean energy, in effect, celebrating the things that have in part led us to this this moment. And then next month, he's visiting Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia in an effort to try to convince uh, MBS to increase oil production. I mean, it's just the contradictions and incoherence at the heart of, of what they're trying to do. And I think you're you're seeing it. Look, you know, you had the, the president propose a gas tax holiday, yeah. uh, probably for three months, 18 cents. Um, he didn't even have Democratic leaders on board for this. I mean, immediately you had Nancy Pelosi raising questions about it. You have Joe Manchin opposing it in the Senate. And it just makes you wonder about the competence of the White House. I mean, it's it, it's it's hard to understand how you would go forward and announce a policy proposal like this that your own party members are going to sort of either shrug off or or criticize right off the bat. Yeah, it, it's not a very um, it's not a very effective White House messaging machine. Well, there's been so much that's been ineffective about this White House, and I want to ask you because I'm I'm curious about this. There are a lot of people who think that all of these decisions are Joe Biden's decisions. Uh, I'm wondering if there are other people influencing him and saying, this is the message, Mr. President. This is the right message. This is what people want to hear and need to hear. It's about climate change. It's about green energy and convincing him. Where do you fall on that? I mean, who is calling the shots? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, you, you talk to, to people in and around the White House and you'll get different answers. Um, there was really good reporting on, on this question in the book that was out, I think, a month ago by the two New York Times reporters called This Will Not Pass. Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns talked about that dynamic in the White House, the push and pull between a staff that's very attentive to sort of the online left, um, the, the woke set. And then Joe Biden, who's got a history of, you know, he, he's not a centrist. I think some people like to label him a centrist. He's not a centrist. He's never been a centrist, but he's always been sort of at the center of the Democratic Party. Um, look, it's it's I don't think that um, I don't think Joe Biden is just a puppet. I don't think he's being entirely manipulated by his staff. That said, there's no question that he's lost a step. I mean, you don't have to. You can watch him give a press yeah. conference. You, you, yeah. He gets into these verbal cul-de-sacs and he doesn't know what he's going to say. And he can't finish a thought. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's it's hard to watch. And yeah, as is. somebody who wants the country to do well, you, you'd hope that he'd, he'd be a little more uh, on task. And I think given that, it's created an additional opening for the White House staff to come in and really shape things. I remember during the discussions um, on some of the COVID funding and the infrastructure funding, talking to Republicans who were meeting with Biden in the White House. And they would say, you know, we sit across from the guy and when he talks to you, he seems sincere. He wants bipartisan input. He seems willing to compromise. And yet in some cases, in several cases during those negotiations and others, Biden would say one thing in a room of the White House to the Republicans he was meeting with and literally at the same time or five minutes later, Jen Psaki would take the podium at the White House press briefing room and say, yeah, we're not talking about spending less money. We're not talking about compromises with Republicans. We're all about growing what we're, we're doing to spend. And I think that just suggests if, if that's happening virtually simultaneously, um, it suggests a president who's not entirely in control of his White House. It's it's astonishing. I, I guess it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, it's sad to me. I, I don't like seeing the the footage of him falling off his bike. I don't like seeing footage right. of him grappling for words. It makes me a little embarrassed and pretty sad. And I, I don't want to see that happen to anyone being humiliated on, on, on 
in footage that's going to go worldwide where the right. rest of the world is going to be looking and going, whoa, Nelly. You know, it's um, the one last thing about this green energy policy and this this hoped for transition from fossil fuels to green. If we're going to have battery operated cars or battery charged cars, the batteries are primarily made in China, are they not? They are. Lots of the component parts, yes. And so we're going to be reliant instead of on our own fuel or on fuel from other places on China for these materials to make these batteries, correct? I mean, there are efforts to try to bring some of the the different components of the supply chain to the United States. This has been a big political talking point for politicians in both parties, but a lot of the raw material, at least some of the raw material comes from China. And so I think inescapably, you're going to have to, there, there will be a continued reliance on Chinese production for at least part of this. It seems to me that the, the common sense answer here is to, to do all of the above, right. right? I mean, I would like to see a transition to cleaner energy as much as, as anybody else. I think climate change is a problem. Um, I think there are reasons to be skeptical of some of the pronouncements we get from the from the the, the zealot climate left. Pronouncements think, like time frame and in six years yeah. we're doomed and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, look at you can look back at some of the predictions that people were making 10, 15 years ago. And yeah. you know, I'm not I'm not sitting here underwater. I mean, right. you, you've had some of these apocalyptic predictions from the climate change extremists that haven't borne out and I think have done too much to shape in many respects, to shape climate policy in the United States. Having said that, you know, if there was a question 20 years ago about whether climate change was a thing and, and whether humans contributed to it, I think climate change is a thing. And I think we do contribute to it. We know enough now. And you don't need to listen to, you know, UN experts or, or climate alarmists to come to that conclusion. Go visit wine growers in Napa Valley who have changed entirely the way that they produce wine to accommodate these new realities, these new climate realities. Mm -hmm. So it's happening. We should be mindful of it. And certainly to the extent that we can move to, to cleaner energy, I think we should be doing it. But that doesn't mean shutting down entire industries that yeah. have helped driven our economy for, for years. And as you point out, I mean, I think this is really an important point and an underplayed point. What we're seeing happen with inflation on in, in oil and, in the oil and gas industry really does have a, a particular effect on lower people, lower income levels. It, it is, uh, you know, effectively a regressive tax. No question. And, you know, that's, you can talk about wanting to have people buy Teslas as, as the solution, oh, but God. you can't, you, you can't, if people can't buy Teslas, people can't buy Teslas. That's not exactly. a short term solution. No, this isn't something where you're going to flip the switch and the problem is going to be solved. We need to get there gradually. And by the way, I think nuclear energy is something we absolutely have to look at if we're going to be an all of the above. Absolutely. And I think it's a clean energy. It's safer than it was. Please, somebody step up and, and make this happen. OK, well, we talked about inflation. We talked about gas prices. We talked a little bit about China. I want to talk to you more about China because there's a remarkable series in your publication, The Dispatch, on this Uyghur population and the forced labor there. So more with Stephen Hayes right after this. You know, I learned something that was sort of disturbing to me. 85% of the grass beef in stores and online is imported from overseas. Did you know that? You might be paying a premium price for low quality foreign meat. So I've got your answer. Good Ranchers. They guarantee 100% American meat delivered to your door for a great price. Good Ranchers helps you solve the meat problem and lets you support American farms and ranches with every purchase. You can shop Good Ranchers for ribeyes, T-bones, chicken, salmon, and more, and their beef earns the highest USDA grade possible. Good Rancher sells 100% American meat and ships it straight to your door. And right now they're giving away two free 18 ounce prime center cut ribeyes to every person that uses my code to FOIA. You can make a one-time purchase or why don't you subscribe and save 25 bucks a box. Plus, like I said earlier, you'll get those two free 18 ounce boneless ribeyes. These are restaurant quality. They are so good. Other places would charge you 50 or 60 bucks a piece, but not good ranchers. And this is a limited stock item. First come, first serve. And you want to be first when it comes to good ranchers. They deliver the best of American farms and ranches to your door. Make sure you take time today. Go right now to goodranchers.com slash Tafoya, T-A-F-O-Y-A, or use my code Tafoya, T 
T-A-F-O-Y-A, when you check out and get your two free 18-ounce ribeyes. Start the summer off right with Good Ranchers American Meat Delivered. Stephen, there's a, a remarkable series in the dispatch on the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act. Am I saying the name of that right? You I'm, are. I'm, yes. I'm trying it. to look at my camera and not look at us. Um, <laughs> and it's it's a remarkable uh, series of of articles, and they're worth reading. And I have, for a number of years now, just kind of personally, I, I, I try to stay away from anything produced in China. Yeah. In some cases, it's next to impossible, but in a lot of cases, it's possible. And so in those cases, I do it. It's hard for me to imagine. Uh, I have a friend who works for the Target Corporation. She is a buyer. And she said to me, have you ever been to a factory in China? And I said, have you been to all the factories in China? Because I would imagine you could walk into one factory in China and it's going to appear humane and right. clean and wonderful and, you know, happy. But that doesn't mean that they aren't reliant in some way, shape or form on this forced Uyghur labor. What's What was the origin of this this reporting that this fabulous reporter did and, and why you guys decided to, to look at this? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it really is a, a, a terrific piece. We're very proud to have published it. It's basically an oral history of the U.S. Congress's efforts to impose some restrictions on on the use of products or the importing of products um, as a result of forced labor in China and particularly in Xinjiang province. And, you know, one of the things we do at the dispatch, we try to take really complicated issues and make them comprehensible for people. We, we try to, you know, strip out the jargon that you yeah. get from a lot of DC insider publications and just say like, okay, you, you come to this issue, you vaguely know what's going on. You know that there are Uyghurs in China, you know that they, that there are reports of concentration camps, that there are reports of, of American and international companies using that labor what happened? And that was really the origin of, of this piece by uh, our reporter, Haley Bird Wilt, who uh, was a colleague of mine at the Weekly Standard, does really terrific work on, on Capitol Hill. And this is a passion piece for her. We call it a soul piece. This is something that she's very passionate about. She's followed it for a long time. She read a book about uh, forced labor in China when she was in high school, and she's followed the issue closely ever since. So she produced this this series of pieces. It's twenty thousand words hmm. in total. It's a, it's almost a, a mini book. And what she tried to do was just walk people through the problem. Here's the problem. Here's what's happening. Here's how it came about. And here's what the U.S. response has been. And you know, it, it it's a it's a very interesting story. And, and you know, the point you made. Uh, in, in introducing the subject is a really important one. Some of, we know that there's a fair amount of forced labor that is conducted and performed in the Xinjiang province where these Uyghurs are detained in these, in these labor camps, concentration camps. But it's also the case that the Chinese government is shipping Uyghurs throughout the country to have them work in other factories. So potentially like the one that your friend who works for Target may have seen and wouldn't necessarily be obvious that this is forced, that this is a forced labor situation. So it, it's hard. This is one of the things that the legislation that, um, that Congress agreed upon and passed tried to address. It's hard to say, you know, we're going to ban products that use labor from this particular place at this particular time, because the Chinese have been smart about how they've they've distributed this yes. makes it harder to keep track of, but it's an incredibly important uh, piece of reporting. And we're, we're very proud to have published it. I, I it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> I would encourage people to take the time to go and, and, and take it a piece at a time. I mean, they produce it in five parts and it's, you can take it in chunks and really learn so much from it. And again, um, I, you know, I had Annis Cantor freedom, the former NBA player who's been sort of, banned from the NBA for lack of a better term. And he is adamant about this as well. It was a really interesting conversation with him. He is thoroughly committed to the extent that he has basically given up his yeah. playing career in the NBA and he's only 30 years old. He, he what a hero. Least another yeah, he really is. He really is uh, tremendously committed. Um, so I would encourage people to look at this. 
We've got a little more time with Stephen Hayes. So I want to talk about the January 6th hearings. I see that on your Twitter feed a lot. I know it's, it matters to you. So I want to ask you why you think it's important and what do you think we're going to get out of it? It's right up to this. Folks, since last November, the stock market has plummeted, but gold, it's been on the rise. Gas prices, you've seen them. They're ridiculous. The stock market is all over the place. Inflation is at a 40-year high. And now we've got this war with Russia and Ukraine that we hope doesn't spread any further than that. And the markets, they don't like this kind of instability. And there's instability all over the place. But there's good news. You have options. Gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold for protection. Gold provides a hedge against inflation and protects against a weakening dollar. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust for investing in gold and silver. You need an investment that's going to protect your wealth and your retirement. Call Legacy Precious Metals today. Be proactive while there's still time. I, I hate to remind you, but back in 2008, those who invested in gold saw gains while other people simply lost their retirements. Legacy Precious Metals can advise you on all your options for investing in gold and silver. So why don't you give them a call? you got nothing to lose. Just ask your questions. You can speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals at 866-528-1903. That's 866-528-1903. Or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. Back with Stephen Hayes, the CEO of the Dispatch. Again, I, I, I recommend you take a look at it. It is really, a, a, if you're if you like if you're like me and you like to read a lot of different perspectives, you've got to include the Dispatch in there. Um, so January sixth, it seems like this topic is really splitting the country in some ways. Sure. Some people just don't care about these hearings. Other people are hanging on every word. Why do you think they're important? Yeah. I, so let me give you a little context for, for where I come from on this. I mean, I'm a conservative. I've been a conservative for as long as I can remember. Um, the Dispatch is a conservative media company. And um, I believe in things like limited government. And I, I want um, less government interference in virtually every aspect of, of our lives. Um, I also believe strongly in the rule of law. And I think what we saw in the lead up to the January 6th violence um, was an attempt by Donald Trump to remain in power after he lost an election. And it is really the only time that we have had real resistance to the peaceful transfer of power in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem. And I think that the, the committee itself is misnamed a bit because it's not really just about that spasm of violence on that particular day. What it's really about, and I think what's come through in the hearings that we've seen so far, is that there was this concerted choreographed effort for Donald Trump to remain in power, despite the fact that he lost, that his people told him he lost, that there were investigations that showed that he lost, and uh, that he, in fact, understood that he lost. And we just can't, ha we just can't have that in the United States. So I'm, I'm happy as a conservative that this is getting a detailed look. And one of the things that I think has made the, the hearings more effective, I think, than skeptics thought they would be, is the fact that most of the people who are doing the speaking are Republicans, are conservatives, including many people who wanted Donald Trump to win the election. Mm -hmm. And it has had a sort of just the facts um, sort of recitation to it, which is Good. I mean, you have somebody like Adam Schiff, who's a Democrat from California, so on the committee, one of the questioners, and has, I think, burned his credibility in many ways. You know, yeah. he was one of the primary proponents of, of so op he was overhyping claims about Russia, making claims that he had evidence that he, in fact, didn't have, he couldn't back right. up. He just hasn't been a very central figure in this because it's the people who actually did the investigations and are working on this who are, are the ones talking about it. Well, it's been interesting. I think my guess is that what people want is for the conclusion to be reached such that Trump can't run again. Do you think that's the goal here or is there something else I'm missing? I mean, I think that's certainly the goal. You know, you've heard from people like Liz Cheney, one of the Republicans leading the, the committee, the vice chair of the committee, that she wants to keep Donald Trump from running for office again. That is part of her her goal. She's been very sort of straightforward about that. Um yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the the 
accumulated evidence about what he tried to do there. I certainly think that's an appropriate goal. And I, I thought he should have been impeached. Um, I wish Republicans would have, uh, would have convicted him in the Senate. Um, I do think that's part of the goal. To, to me, there's sort of a bigger um, goal, a longer term goal, and that is establishing a credible historical record of what happened here. It's really important that we actually n- learn the facts. Yeah. And I wish that there had been a truly bipartisan commission. I wish yeah. that, you know, in the days after January 6th, you had Republican leaders saying, we want a commission. We want a bipartisan commission to take a detached look at this, to give us all the facts. And I think many of them were saying that so that they didn't have to vote for impeachment. They would say, well, I'm not going to vote for impeachment, but I'm for this bipartisan commission. Right. And then it never happened. And I think it didn't happen both because Nancy Pelosi politicized it right away. Right. Away. Um, she deserves a lot of blame for that. There were sort of quiet behind the scenes discussions between Republicans and Democrats about the creation of this kind of a commission. And she sent out a letter to Democrats only saying, here's what the commission is going to be like. And it effectively ended a lot of those quiet behind the scenes conversation. But Republicans are also to blame. I mean, you know, people like Mitch McConnell said that uh, privately that he thought that Republicans had the vote to convict Donald Trump. He said that he wanted to get to, to the bottom of this and then didn't support a commission. I wish he would have. Do you think he didn't support a commission? Because again, when the, the the Republican members were nominated, Nancy Pelosi made the decision as to who was on the committee and who wasn't. And there are only two Republicans, right? Yep. Cheney and uh, Adam Kinzinger. And so was, is that part of this um, sort of retaliation by the Republicans for lack of a better term that they don't see this as, as a fair process? Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. And and you know, I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic to that argument. Uh, I think for for I think there's also a sort of a simpler and more crass political explanation, and that is Mitch McConnell wants to be majority leader and yeah. Kevin McCarthy wants to be Speaker of the House. And yeah. to the extent that these hearings and this committee uncovered, you know, the kinds of things that I think the committee's uncovering, really troubling things about Donald Trump's effort to remain in power after he lost an election that was likely to you know make it harder for them to win the majority now i think the republicans are going to win the majority in the house i think it's nearly a, a sure thing they've got a good chance of winning the majority in the senate anyway but it would have been better for the country if we had had this kind of bipartisan recognition yeah. that what took place there really should have never taken place and there was this you know you remember this in the days after January 6th, when we didn't have nearly the amount of information about what led up to that day, there was this moment of sort of bipartisan you know, flash of, of bipartisan unity. Like that thing, that stuff shouldn't happen. Right. We should not have that happen. No. And as we've learned, as we've learned more about it, I would like to think that, that, you know, there, there remains sort of this bipartisan consensus that we shouldn't have this. And certainly when you talk to Republicans in private, they will tell you this. They say something different in public because they don't want to get on the, the wrong side of Donald Trump. But in private, they will say, I can't this. Of course, the guy lost the election. I can't believe he tried to stay in power. This is yeah. crazy. Yeah. They don't say that in public. Sheesh. Uh, <laughs> I say that because it's like the more you hear from someone like you who is so tied in that people are saying one thing and then they go out in front of the cameras and say another. It's it's what people abhor about politics yes. and why why there is this group. I think it was David French who called it the exhausted majority. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we are. We're exhausted. And I think Peggy Noonan put it well recently when she said, no, you know, there's never been a, a time when a country needed a hero more than it needs one right now. And I, I hope we Absolutely. find ours. I don't, I don't know who it is yet, but I hope uh, he or she is out there because we'd welcome that. And you're Absolutely. always welcome here, Stephen Hayes. It's been a pleasure talking with you and thanks for covering so much ground with us. Uh, I'd love to do it again. Thank you so much, folks. Read the dispatch, uh, subscribe. It's just some really good, good reading. And like we were talking about earlier, great reporting, Stephen, thank you. Anytime. Thank you. And I hope you'll, uh, you'll repay the favor and, and join us on the Dispatch Podcast. We'd love Absolutely to have you. will. You got it. This has been Sideline Sanity. I'm Michelle Tafoya. Thanks for being here.
So with the economy the way that it is, which is not great, makes you think about what is smart investing these days. I was given a gift of gold by my mom. My husband and I were gifted some gold for a wedding anniversary and we're really grateful. And I am really grateful to Charles Thorngren, who grow, who joins us now from Legacy Precious Metals, a sponsor of Sideline Sanity. Charles, we appreciate you so much. You know, we're hearing more and more about how inflation ain't transitory after all, and it may be here a while. And, you know, food shelves are getting, the lines are longer. It, this is really, it's not the America I grew up in, and it's, it's worrying a lot of people. So if, if someone's thinking about investing, what do you tell them? You, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Investing nowadays, uh, we, we want to go back to kind of the basics, really, where diversification has always been key. And, and we hear it. We've been told it ad nauseum, you know, diversify, diversify. And then everyone puts all their money in the stock market and <laughs> wonders why when there's a pullback, they're in trouble. Diversity means asset class diversity as well. You know, some real estate, um, some precious metals. These are the things that gives your portfolio the legs to stand through all the storms that will happen financially. And, and, and we know that they happen. They happen continuously and they recur. So that's what diversity is truly meant to do. And that's why people used to talk about diversity. So when people see the value of the dollar declining or they see inflation, uh, how do you get the average person like me to understand that gold can still be appreciating or that gold can protect right. against that stuff. How, how does that make sense for people? You know, the, the easiest way to look at it is if you look at gold, right? Gold is the anti-dollar investment. As a dollar gets weaker, gold gets stronger. And we know that because it takes more dollars to buy that gold, just like cars cost more now, right? Um, Anytime you have inflation, the item that you're buying costs more. The difference with gold is that it doesn't devalue. It's considered a alternative currency. Basically, when you say that I don't have complete faith that this financial system is not built on a house of cards, or I don't have complete faith in, in what the current Fed is doing to fight inflation, this is where gold comes in. And this is where we see people increase their amount of gold because a diversified portfolio should have some gold regardless. We need to remember that the United States Fed says 2 to 3% inflation is ideal. So that means for the average saver, if your retirement account's invested and it's based in dollars, that you're going to lose 60% of your purchasing power to inflation by the time you're ready to retire. And that's under the best of terms. And now we can talk about the, oh, it's transitory. Oh, no, maybe I was wrong. Um, maybe we need to do half basis points every month for the rest of the year and then see where it's at next year. These are scary things that mm -hmm. the experts are trying to tell us that maybe we didn't have it right. And this is why people have gold and this is why it offers that protection. It's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I think people think, well, if I'm investing in gold, do I actually possess the gold in, you know, I have it in a safe. Do I have, how do you get gold? How do you keep gold? Right. And, and physical gold. I mean, this is what we do. So yes, if you're buying it outside of an IRA, we can deliver it right to your home and you can put it in your own safe. You can put it in your safety deposit box. If you don't feel comfortable with that, we do offer storage for our clients as well. Okay. So there's lots of options. Uh, in the IRA, it's stored for you, just like your IRA account. You don't have access to those stocks. So if you were to take funds from your IRA, you could make that investment and you'd have the retirement account invested in the precious metals as well. And it would be handled just like every other IRA account. That's really interesting. And, and now I'm going to ask you a tough one, and I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm just going to be candid uh, and, and ask what I think might be coming to people's minds. Sure. If the experts in Washington are making all these mistakes or they were wrong about inflation, then they're going to look at you and say, hey, Charles, why should I trust what you're telling me and why Legacy Precious Metals is the place to go? I'm, I'm asking this in an honest sure. way because I, I, I know you want to be transparent about this stuff. So how would you Absolutely. answer that? You know, it really is, is. I'm not a politician. Um, <laughs> I have no desire to be a politician. I like what I do, right? I help people prepare their finances. I help people 
with their retirements. I help people set up their funds so that their children and their grandchildren have something that's there. This is what I do. This is what I do for uh, enjoyment. Um, uh, very big in economics. Um, um, but metals is that thing that it's an alternative asset, right? When I was a stockbroker 30 plus years ago, it was unique kind of then. And then everybody was a stockbroker and everyone had stocks and there was nothing different. There was no protection. Everyone said the same thing. To me, it didn't make sense for everyone to be doing the same thing. If we all do the same thing, then we all fall together. And we know that if you follow the government's direction, you're buying into whatever they want to sell you. Now, it used to be politics was a little different. We've gotten into a place where we can't say that anymore. It's not always for the people. It's We see that. We see that what they're doing with the economy itself. We know that we have to have something else. And this is why we do what we do here at Legacy. And my history is is why people should, you know, give us a call, chat with us and see if it makes sense for them. Last thing I want to ask you about is I remember 2008 and I know a lot of people mm -hmm. do. And it, 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 you know, that was a crash and there've been other crashes, but why is it that when the economy crashes, gold has historically risen? I know you said it's sort of the anti-dollar, right? Is there a way in it layman's terms to explain why that happens? It's, it's the safe place. Right. When, when, when there's so much risk out there and people are losing so much money, they just want safety. Mm -hmm. So l let's look at inflation. We know right now we're running close to eight and a half percent. Yeah, uh, we can dig some real numbers out there and we can debate that. But we'll just take that number as it is. We'll use eight percent. That means everything costs you eight percent more this year than it did last year. And we know it's going to go higher because the Fed's already promised us a lot more interest rate raises right to fight inflation but we know it's not enough when they say things like we'll try to raise half a basis point five times over the next six months and see where the economy's at next year that in itself lets you know you need to find something that doesn't put your livelihood in their hands they're, they're juggling an economy and the stock market. And it was never meant to be that way. So you have to protect yourself. And this is where gold comes in because it is the anti-dollar. The weaker the dollar gets, the stronger gold gets. And, you know, 2008, I remember after it happened, um, the people that would call and try to salvage their retirement accounts. And it was a very devastating time. People would call and they would be crying that they can't retire now. They have to continue to work. They're 67 years old and their plants are gone because they lost half their value. And that's devastating, you know, but this is where those who were involved in gold, they saw gold almost double in price. It offset the losses. It offset the losses. So again, Charles is not suggesting that you put all your money in one place no. that not even gold, but diversify your assets and precious metals is a good way to go. And legacy precious metals is the only company I trust when I talk about and do my investing in gold and silver, and you can contact them as well. Legacypminvestments.com, legacypminvestments.com. I don't know why you would waste another minute thinking about it. Just talk to them. I mean, just ask them, see what your situation can, can manage and handle and might require and just get some answers. Uh, Charles, I appreciate your time. Thanks for this. It's been very educational. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.